She'll be talking about inclusive language teaching in pandemic times, um, something she is uh, well qualified to do as she is a professor in second language acquisition in the Department of English Language and Linguistics at Lancaster University. Um, she's the co-author of the book, Teaching Languages to Students with Specific Learning Differences with Anne Margaret Smith. And she has published widely on the effect of dyslexia on learning additional languages, including a book entitled The Second Language Learning Process of Students with Specific Learning Difficulties. She's the author of multiple research papers that investigate the role of cognitive factors in second language acquisition. So that is more than enough for me. I'm delighted to, to welcome Judith and look forward to what she has to share. Welcome everybody. And it's really great to see uh, all of you. Let me see why. Why doesn't the, the PowerPoint load? It did load. Um, well, what, what's happening here? Uh, one moment, sorry, that's technology. Um, right, okay, it's working. So uh, it's absolutely fantastic to be invited to the Global Schools Festival. And, um, and it's always such a great opportunity to meet so many people from all over the, the world. And, um, and I'm really excited to be talking to you about inclusive language teaching during pandemic times. And these are challenging times um, for everybody all over the world. Maybe there are a few fortunate of you who are not so much affected by the virus, but uh, I think most of the world is. And, um, the life of students with specific learning difficulties so, and students with disabilities um, is particularly hard um, during this period because they do have challenges um, in their learning um, in typical classrooms, even in less stressful times. And the pandemic has probably aggravated those challenges and difficulties. And, and they are often kind of forgotten because we are just so busy uh, with managing online learning and, and making whatever uh, possibilities um, are available for these students. Um, uh, 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 possible and, 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 and making the best of, of online teaching. But, but I think we shouldn't forget about these students and, and we should try to, to assist them um, so that they don't fall behind. Um, in this talk, I'm going to what, the, what these specific learning difficulties are so that you understand uh, what uh, type of learners uh, I am discussing and, and you see what kind of challenges these students who constitute 10% of our student population, no matter where we live, if you have 10 students, one of them is likely to have uh, some kind of learning challenge. And what, what, do, what kind of um, effects uh, do these learning challenges have on the cognitive, emotional and social aspects of language, learnings, language learning are important to understand so that we can effectively help these students in uh, acquiring another language. Um, once I have um, done that, I'm going to discuss the advantages and disadvantages of online learning um, and pandemic in play, play, person classroom for students with specific learning difficulties. What are the challenges in these two contexts and what are some of the affordances of these contexts that we could exploit? And then finally, I think something that you're all very interested in, how can we support these students in pandemic times so that they achieve the best of their potential? So what type of specific learning difficulties are there? Um, the classification of specific learning difficulties does differ country by country or region by region, but most often the most important types of specific learning difficulties are related to dyslexia, uh, which in the very narrow sense of the word means word level reading problems and, and reading comprehension problems. In some countries, dyslexia encompasses um, reading difficulties as they are. Uh, but as you will see, um, read, dyslexia doesn't just affect uh, reading. Um, but And it also has a very significant impact on language learning. There is this calculation. Uh, which is to do with, with numbers, it, if it occurs alone, it has less impact on language learning. It is mostly when you need to consider it when you teach numbers to the students or if you teach mathematics through, through English. Um, 
some uh, other specific learning difficulties include dyspraxia, which is a problem with fine and gross motor coordination. And it's in some countries, it's overlapping with dysgraphia, which uh, um, causes uh, problems in handwriting, spelling, and writing. In some um, contexts, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder is also considered to be a specific learning difficulty. Um, and, and in some other countries, um, autism spectrum disorder are also classified under specific learning difficulties. In the psychological literature, it's only dyslexia, dyscalculia, and dyspraxia, dysgraphia which are part of specific learning difficulties, but I think it's important to consider these together. Um, the, these specific learning difficulties, of course, vary in their severity, and they also overlap with each other, which means that students with specific learning difficulties vary quite a lot. Some of them are very successful language learners and just have mild um, manifestations of, uh, of specific learning difficulties, and some have really uh, serious um, problems, and, and their problems are wide-ranging. Uh, in order to understand um, how specific learning difficulties affect language learning and learning in general, it's important to know what causes uh, a specific uh, learning difficulties. One of them is um, phonological processing problems. And this is mainly the cause of reading related challenges. Students with specific learning difficulties have um, um, uh, problems, uh, challenges in perceiving how sounds work in a language. Uh, what is the distinction between certain sounds? How do sounds relate to, uh, to letters? How can we manipulate uh, sounds? These are areas that they tend to fall behind other students. Students with specific learning difficulties also tend to have a shorter uh, working memory uh, span. That's the number of information you can hold in mind before it's transferred into long-term memory. Everything passes through short-term or working memory when you are trying to learn something new. And our working memory has a limited capacity. For most people, it's between seven and nine units of information. But for students with specific learning difficulties, this can go down to four to five. And that can cause problems in vocabulary learning, remembering information, remembering longer instructions, et cetera. Um, students with specific learning difficulties also tend to process information somewhat more slowly. And that causes issues because if you have a large classroom and you need to, um, uh, you need to follow a curriculum, then the, their pace of learning is going to be slower and you need to try to cater for, for their slower speed. Um, and then another area is executive functions, um, which uh, mainly if you want to understand them in, in plain terms, it's problems with regulating and directing your attention. Uh, students uh, tend to struggle with paying attention uh, for a long time and focusing their attention on one issue. Um, other problems um, can, um, can be related to visual memory. Some students don't have really good visual memory, some do, and, and also motor coordination. So how you coordinate your, your hand and, and fine uh, motor movements. And of course, if you're learning how to write or, uh, um, or how to um, do different smaller activities, that can be um, a problem. So what impact um, does this have on second language learning? Um, Obviously, one of the key uh, difficulties that are related to dyslexia, which is one of the most uh, frequently um, diagnosed and known uh, type of specific learning difficulty is reading. Students are slower readers in their first language and often in their second language as well. And they are less accurate readers as well. They misread words. They may not understand the text entirely, et cetera. Then remembering information through listening because their working memory capacity is smaller writing because it requires spelling um, and also it requires coordination of attention, um, commitment, um, and, and organizing your ideas uh, in a coherent framework. And you can also um, observe that issue in speaking. Students might not be able to organize a longer speech coherently because their attention wanders away. And also because they can't really pay attention to accuracy and speaking fluently and, and conveying the content at the same time. And difficulties also um, uh, relate to vocabulary learning. For these students, remembering and learning new vocabulary can be a real challenge. Um, 
And there are also effective aspects of, uh, of second language of uh, specific learning difficulties. One of them um, is related to, uh, to empathy for students with uh, autistic uh, spectrum disorder. Um, they, they might find it challenging to put themselves into the shoes of other pers of other people and, and feel empathy in, in certain situations. Um, Specific learning difficulties also cause anxiety in the students because they know they are not performing at the level of their cognitive abilities, at the level other students are doing, and that causes anxiety. Um, students usually tend to fall behind uh, very early in their school years, and that lowers their self-esteem and self-confidence. And then that ultimately results in loss of motivation. And, and that's when we, we tend to lose these students because um, uh, they, they are not willing to invest the energy they, they need to in language learning and they would need to invest extra energy anyway. So that's when, when they really fall behind and, and maybe they stop learning languages or, or, or they fail. There are also social aspects of specific language, um, of specific learning difficulties. One of these relates to social communication. That's particularly true for students with autistic spectrum uh, disorder. They tend to find uh, social interactions particularly challenging. We humans are unpredictable. Um, there is so much going on in, in a social interaction context that, that they find it difficult to cope with. They, they also find it challenging to take the perspective of the, the other person. And, and that can cause problems, for example, in, in group work, collaboration, and, and cooperation. And, um, and students with, uh, with uh, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, they, they um, do struggle with following rules and, 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 and norms. And these are, again, all important to understand if we want to help students in, um, in becoming successful in these challenging times. And of course, we shouldn't forget that there are uh, strengths related to specific learning difficulties. And I have just collected some of them. Um, many of these students are really great uh, thinkers holistically. Um, they can see through issues. They, they are very creative. They have original ideas. They have a really good spatial knowledge. You find a lot of uh, architects who have dyslexia um, because they can see the space um, in a very novel and uh, way. Uh, they, are, they have good problem solving skills and they also have peripheral vision. They, they notice things at the periphery um, that people normally wouldn't. So these are again skills that you might want to build on in group projects, for example. So let us uh, move over to um, some of the advantages of online learning for students with specific learning difficulties. When um, move to online learning happened in, in many contexts in emergency situations, um, there were some advantageous features of, of, of this, um, this change for these students. Um, often because there was more flexibility with timing and tasks. Um, it wasn't that you had to sit in the classroom, tasks were given over a longer period, uh, some, you know, not all the sessions were held, you, you had more flexibility uh, with, with the work. Uh, more if <clears throat> online uh, learning was taking place, where students do have good access to technology, they had more assistive tools available for them. They could use spell checkers, they could use text to speech software um, that, that, uh, that helped them. And, and also very often the movement um, that there was more project based learning teachers um, moved over from some more traditional forms of assessment, for example, uh, you can't really do a timed multiple choice test, um, or you can but but you know that the teacher, students will have the book open in front of them so testing the kind of factual knowledge of students um, is being delegated to the background and teachers tended to use more, port more, more portfolio project type based tasks and assessment. And, and also for students who have Asperger syndrome or autistic spectrum disorder, there were fewer demands on complex social interaction skills because the, everybody was sitting at home. And of course there is social interaction going on in this online environment, but it is less complex uh, in some ways than, than the busy uh, classroom where 20 students are talking at the same time. There are groups of students together, et cetera. Um, 
There are, of course, also disadvantages of online learning. Uh, one, and, and, and some of the advantages that I mentioned can actually do, can also be seen as disadvantages or turn into disadvantages. And with the, with the flexibility, um, there comes a less structured learning environment where, um, where the student's day is less, less structured. Um, they may not get up, they might still be in their pajamas and, and, and they have to keep in mind all the different type of um, the submission deadlines, et cetera. There is lower level of teacher control. The teacher is there maybe at the, behind the screen, um, but, but for, for projects, et cetera, that the students would be in the classroom and now they have to do kind of outside the classroom, there is lot, a lot less teacher control. So it all requires a higher level of autonomy and, and, and self-regulation from, from the students. They are left to their own devices um, to, to do these tasks. There is also long screen time um, that students have to uh, spend in front of the computer, which is tiring. And, and those of you who have taught Zoom sessions, I find them almost twice as tiring as real life classrooms. Um, and there are also fewer social clues on screen. You only see people up to their necks and uh, I'm trying to gesture with my hands, but often people actually hide their hands. So there is just less uh, social clues, which actually might be difficult for students to, to read. Um, and we need to bear this in mind. When, um, when people, so when, when we were planning this session, um, we were thinking, oh, students would be back in their classrooms. And in some countries, they are still back in their classrooms. Um, and in some countries, they are studying at home again. Um, but let's think about uh, the pandemic face-to-face -face classroom, which is not exactly the same classroom as, as uh, we had before the pandemic. There is, there is anxiety related to, um, to, to the virus, to, the, to its effect on the family, but, but the, whole, the whole atmosphere in, in the school is much less relaxed than it, than it used to be. There are new rules, hygienic rules, which are very difficult to, to follow for younger kids. They need to keep uh, distance. And, and even at the university level, when I was teaching face-to-face -face at the University of Vienna, we had a one meter distance. When I asked students to work in pairs, they immediately moved closer to each other. And I had to say, sorry, you have to keep the distance. Uh, and you can imagine how difficult that is for younger kids. Um, in being to students, uh, also some of the students with specific learning difficulties, they got used to the assistive tools and the online tasks that they had to do and, and they, they found them useful and, and may, they may not have access to them anymore in the, the actual classroom. So there is no spell checker when you have to handwrite a, an, an essay or there is no uh, speech to text software when you have to read a, a short story. And many, we shouldn't forget, most importantly, that many of the students might have fallen behind in, in the uh, pre-face-to-face uh, uh, pre, uh, phase of the pandemic because of the challenges that they uh, experienced. Um, they, they were less able to, to study on their own. Nobody was looking over their shoulders. So they probably have fallen behind their, their peers. Um, so uh, what can we do to support students in online contexts? Um, first of all, um, and maybe it's not that relevant anymore because uh, you have already settled on your online platforms. Um, but if you haven't, then you really need to explain how the various pla online platforms work. And you might assume that students are digitally savvy um, and would figure it out. In my experience, even university students were struggling with certain Certain features in, in Zoom, et cetera. Um, and, and, and especially if, if your school uses multiple platforms, um, then that can be quite challenging. Um, it's, I think it's also very important to dedicate special tasks, online forums, hold online uh, discussions regularly, not just once or twice, on how to learn at home. Um, students do benefit from, from this advice in these sessions, and you can see the impact. Um, there are so many tips you can to, uh, give to students how to organize their, their home environment, if that's possible, how to structure their, their day, how to keep uh, track of deadlines, and that they need constant reminders about this. Um, 
Again, assistive devices, there are a lot of online assistive uh, devices that students can use to help them um, with, uh, with transforming, for example, written text into speech. And now many speech recognition software uh, types are really, really good and they are free of charge. They can cope even with, with accented uh, speech. Uh, there's speech recognition software in almost every language. Um, and and you, you need to teach the students how to use this because again, even though they are technologically savvy, they may not um, be able know uh, how to use them. Um, now, I think it's also useful to have one-to-one -one meetings like a checkup session with students who know who have specific learning difficulties or small group meetings with them to check on how they are doing particularly and what support they need. Um, and, and of course, if you have a large classroom or if that's not possible, then you can um, designate some peer mentors. You can pair up the students and, and, and ask uh, their peer to check up on them and then report back to you or, or have someone who helps them with their projects, with their classwork. Uh, maybe like a body when they, dis they discuss, okay, we're both going to sit down together in front of the computer and we'll do this project together. A bit like a digital online writing retreat that I have been doing with my colleagues. Just having committed the time and knowing that somebody is sitting there with you um, and doing the same thing, that, that helps. Um, Bite-sized online learning is also crucial for students with specific learning difficulties because they are slower, they can keep fewer pieces of information in mind. So it's very important if you use projects to break them down into smaller steps um, and smaller stages and stagger instructions. Um, if there is a large project, students uh, with specific learning difficulties will forget the steps um, they need to take. So uh, you might just give one step at a time. And once they have done that, okay, here is the next instruction. This is what you should do next. Um, it's also um, useful to try to adjust tasks to the student's attention span. So if you deliver synchronous sessions, um, May break up the, the session into parts when um, the teacher talking time is, uh, um, um, is, is broken by certain activities that the students uh, can do. Um, this can be periods of physical activity when students get up from their desk and, and, and go and get something and then show it to, uh, to their cl uh, uh, classmates or do some physical exercise. Um, or, or do an, an online um, game um, or, or a, a Kahoot or, 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 or Quizlet or whatever activity um, that, um, that breaks up the longer session. Uh, when uh, students have to work on their own, you can also teach them the, the Pomodoro technique, which is uh, you break up the task and you say, okay, I'm just going to focus on, on one phase of this task, um, reading or writing something for 10 minutes. I set the timer. So the timer is the kitchen timer, the, the tomato um, that we may often use for cooking. And when those 10, 10 minutes are over, you can reward yourself with a five minute break or a, or a hot chocolate or whatever. And then again, you return for another 10 minutes, you have a five minute break again, and then you can increase the period from 10 to 15 minutes and always give yourself a break and some reward. And there's a really nice app um, called uh, Plenty app, which uh, actually do gives you the reward. And every time you have, uh, um, you can set it on your computer and every time you manage not to check your phone and other websites, then you get a little plant. And then um, if you have been doing long enough, you will have a, a digital garden with plants. So I think that's a nice one for, for smaller kids, but even teenagers like, it, like that. Um, accessibility of online learning materials is again crucial. It's important to use multiple modes of presentation if possible. Um, so if you present information to your students, try to do it in, uh, in auditory as well as in written format or video or, or pictures. Um, and, and, and use visual support to the students so that uh, they don't have to read so much. Very often when we teach online, we give students kind of long written instructions. This is the instruction for the project, um, do it. Um, 
If you do give uh, written instruction in such a long format, make sure, for example, that you use a file format, which is easy to convert into um, accessible uh, speech. For example, a Word doc, a Microsoft Word can do it very easily and it can be read out for the student. If you give it in a PDF, they, it won't be easy to, to read out. Um, think about allowing students alternative response formats. Um, of course, it depends again on the curricular uh, requirements, but if possible, think about whether the student can actually give a narrated PowerPoint presentation instead of a written essay, or whether they can do a, a video um, where, where they speak in, instead of uh, some written tasks, or they use both uh, spoken language as well as, as writing. Um, and, and also, if possible, give the students the choice and options in tasks how they want to complete them. Uh, some students might prefer uh, writing, some might prefer uh, speaking, some might prefer visual illustrations. And, 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 and if you have the option to, to give the students a choice, think about it because students can really uh, perform to their best abilities if they are given these opportunities. Um, some other tips for supporting online learning. Um, I would really strongly recommend that you can harness students' strengths uh, with project-based multimedia and portfolio-based assessments. You saw the kind of um, strengths the students with specific learning difficulties have, and they, are re they can really play a crucial part in these uh, group projects um, as creators, as, as holistic thinkers, etc. I have already mentioned it, um, but I think it's important to vary plenary work with breakout rooms or some offline work in synchronous sessions and using interactive tools during synchronous sessions such as Kahoot, Mentimeter, uh, Pause, Padlet, Wall, online quizzes are again um, uh, tools that help everyone but students with specific learning difficulties particularly appreciate it because of their shorter attention span. Um, what can we do in in-person um, classes? Um, first of all, once students have returned from online learning, it's really important to have an assessment of their progress and achievement during this period to see who has fallen behind and who are the students who need uh, help. Um, and then we can actually try to support these students with one-to-one -one sessions or some extra tasks that they, they, can, they can do. Um, um, after, after they have returned from, from an online um, uh, learning environment. Um, if you have just returned from, from um, the online to the face-to-face, -face, it's important to explain and agree on the new classroom rules jointly and set up like a charter and, and explain to the students why certain things are necessary. Um, that's really um, essential that the students agree to those rules and internalize them because if they feel this is kind of externally forced on them, they will be less likely to follow them. Um, giving students time to adjust to this new um, situation is, is also um, necessary, uh, particularly for students with, um, with Asperger syndrome or, or ADHD who are used to to work at home in their own space, um, uh, for maybe with fewer distractions and, and fewer social interaction. So it, it is important, if possible, to observe the student's personal space. So students with uh, autism on the autism spectrum, um, they require more personal space. Maybe they are advantaged in this pandemic situation because we have to keep the social distance. Um, but uh, what also helps students who have uh, um, attention and hyperactivity uh, problems, allow them to move around the classroom, to stand up, do a um, walk around the classroom uh, for one minute and then sit down, because maybe that's what they were doing at home during even online sessions with their camera switched off, they were listening, but maybe they were walking up and down in the room and that helped them. Um, and also think about how you can maintain um, the flexibility of online learning that the students enjoy. Uh, can you incorporate certain elements of online learning into your classroom that uh, was helpful for the students? Um, so um, these were kind of my, um, my tips, my, my suggestions uh, for, for, for um, helping students in this uh, challenging era. And I'd like to show you two um, online um, um, task banks, which are um, 
um, absolutely free to use and were developed in a European fund in two European funded projects. One is a digital task bank for um, uh, students in between the fourth and eighth class, so that students aged between 10 and, and 14. Uh, we have um, uh, digital tasks um, that engage vocabulary learning, uh, reading, listening uh, skills for English as well as German, and geared at the interest of, of, uh, of children, and they are dyslexia friendly, students can work on them on their own, or you can set it as, as homework, we have projects there as well, um, so that's um, and that's the engaged task bank. And we also have a new app which helps students write essays. So that's for higher level learners. And it works with comics. And it also, uh, the reading texts in these comics, some of them are actually about disabilities also. So it helps students understand disabilities, but also they are about the UN sustainability goal, development goals. So they might be quite um, an interesting read for students all over the world. And I, I think it might resonate with with the problems um, that they might experience and again it's a new way of, of presenting text creatively using uh, comics um, and there are some other resources um, i have written an, a, a, a guide um, a, a research and, and and teaching tip guides for cambridge university press and and books and you can also join us next april for our free uh, online uh, learning course the mooc on on future learn so thank you very much for your attention and I'm really looking forward to receiving your questions. Well, thank you very much indeed, Judith. Um, that was genuinely fascinating and really quite uplifting. And, um, and it's been really nice looking at the, the comments coming through continually as you were talking and people have obviously found it very practical and um, very, very use, you know, very, very useful and very, very interesting. So, so thank you. Um, there are there's a few minutes for questions, and I just, you know, as, as so much of this is about online, um, one here is, what is the recommended length of time for children with specific learning difficulties to spend in front of electronic devices per day, if such a thing can be truly defined? Well, I don't think that can be defined. And again, that depends on, on, um, on the social context and the parental norms. Uh, in terms of uh, education, I mean, it's, uh, I think having like four, it, again, it depends on age and, and the curricular requirements. What, what, what is important for students with specific learning difficulties that like having a session like this, um, when the teacher is talking for 30 minutes uh, to the screen, it's terribly challenging for them. So if I were to do this uh, with specific students with specific learning difficulties, I would stop after talking five or seven minutes, give them a task and then uh, having them listen to me again um, for after five or seven minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, another question here, this is from Nicola. Um, as a dyslexic teacher and with students with a variety of specific learning difficulties, what can we do to get rid of the old stereotypes and misinformation about learning difficulties? Well, it's, it's not easy. That's what I've been trying to do basically 15 years um, into my career, or nearly 20 now. There are so many misconceptions and, um, and, and I'm constantly writing about them. And, and I'm, I'm a member of a Hungarian Facebook group with, for dyslexic parents and, and, and I'm, I'm sharing comments about, for example, when, when people post about corrective glasses, um, which, which doesn't have any scientific evidence and it's just trying to get money out of parents of dyslexic students and, 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 and I'm fight, trying to fight against them. But I think the important, um, what you can do as a teacher is to be well informed um, of, of research which is accessible and I have um, produced such uh, guides for, for Cambridge University Press. We are actually including introductions to course books uh, on specific learning difficulties for the uh, Italian market and for new revisions of, of Cambridge course books are going to in, in include such information for teachers. And I think if you are well informed about latest research um, on, on this topic, then, then you can have the authority to fight back against these misconceptions. And I know it's an uphill struggle um, and, and it's not easy, but, um, but I think if teachers are well informed, they can stand up for, for representing uh, more accurate information about specific learning difficulties. 
And thank you for the question. That's a great question. <laughs> And we have a question here from Laura Ferroglio. I hope I've said that right. Um, how can institutions which rely heavily on summative assessment, for example, as was mentioned, multiple choice time tests, be encouraged to implement more formative assessment to promote inclusion? Well, I, I think, um, I mean, again, um, just getting back to, to your course books and new projects for the Italian market, uh, we are in the process of developing these lexia friendly test booklets for, for students uh, so that there is a lot you can do even in the format in the summative assessment to make it uh, dyslexia friendly, giving time extension, making sure the instructions are clear, etc. And, and, and again, I think it's, it's, um, it's advocacy from the from the teachers part, uh, trying to communicate it to to um, to higher level educational stakeholders, uh, and 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 also it's it's teach it's it's the teachers' own practice uh, that that unless you are mandated and and you need certain types of summative assessment, you should include more more formative uh, assessment, and that benefits everybody, not just uh, students with specific learning difficulties. Okay. Thank you. Um, and uh, just check the clock. We, we still have some time. Um, a question from Jara Recio. First, I'd like to express my gratitude for giving a space to talk about this topic. Um, and could you please give your opinion about the debate about medical versus social model of disability? Well, I'm more for the social model. And if you were trying to, to you know, listen to me, I mean, I'm talking about specific learning difficulties or differences. And some people talk about neurodiversity. I didn't really use that term but but i'm more for the social view of, um, of of disabilities and and it's important because that underpins the idea of inclusion that uh, we need to make adjustments as education educators educational institutions to meet the variety of needs of students and and there is a kind of a general kind of in every population there is there is a variety and, and some people even question that specific learning difficulties exist because Cognitive abilities are are, are distributed in, in, in a, on a scale, and and in every scale that you assess, people will there will be people who belong to the ten percent who are doing um, less well on on that assessment, and and it's probably just part of the typical variation that we see in in any population. Um, but but of course, if we do away with the term specific learning difficulties, that has important educational implications because then they won't have access to certain support systems, etc. Um, so I'm not advocating that we shouldn't use that term at all because because of certain reasons for educational policy. But uh, I'm I'm more I'm definitely not for the medical view. I don't think these are. Um, medical, they, they are the, the, the concern of medical professionals. Uh, it's, it's an educational issue. Of course, for the diagnosis and assessment, you might need specialists, but they should be psychologists or very well-trained teachers, special education teachers who can, who can assess, but definitely not medical. <laughs> okay. And I think we've probably got time for one more. Um, there's a question here about, about how, how, how can we help increase students' working memory? Well, that's not an easy question because, um, to be honest, at the moment there is no kind of definitive scientific evidence that you can actually increase working memory with training. So if you want to help students, you should better teach them learning strategies to remember information rather than train their working memory per se, because there, there is some effect of working memory training, but it doesn't really transfer to other tasks. So um, teaching students strategies, how to remember things, how to connect it to visual images, sounds, uh, colors, uh, similar sounding words, etc., is a much better strategy than, than spending time on, on, on training their working memory, which is actually very boring, those working memory training um, sessions. So uh, yeah, that's my, my advice. Okay. Um, uh, there is now, there's still, I think, time for, for just one more. Um, and uh, Alim Mazek asks, can any teacher teach pupils with specific difficulties? Quick answer, yes. Yes, um, and I, I, that's that's a question I get very often in future learn on other courses. I think teachers with uh, who have a couple of years of teaching experience, they have an intuitive knowledge 
of knowing what to do to help these students. And, and very often I find that when I give these talks some people think, oh, I'm doing that anyway. So all you need is a bit of a reinforcement that yes, that's what the experts also say you should mm -hmm. be doing. And of course, knowing more about specific learning difficulties, learning more in, in, in training courses, et cetera, is, is of course very, very helpful and supports your teaching. But, but I think anyone can do that. It's just, you have to understand what the specific learning difficulties are. And, and you have to think about what benefits every student. And, and then based on that, I'm sure that what benefits every student is going to be helpful for students with specific learning difficulties. Okay, well, thank you so much, Judith. That was genuinely fascinating. As I say, uh, I mean, say thank you on the behalf of Cambridge University Press and also on behalf of all the, the many hundreds of people who were, were listening in. Uh, as I say, the comments have been, been great. Um, just something, just taking one here, random. Thanks so much for a very informative and inspiring talk. And they're all along those lines. So uh, thank you again, Judith, and uh, thank you. Thank, thanks for thanks for thanks for all the information and being here with us today. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you all the more than five hundred people who joined and really feel humbled <laughs> by that number. Okay, thank you very much. Great. Bye bye. Bye.